Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Optimistic Future podcast. Today, I am looking forward to chatting with Angela from the group Scotian Shores. I met Angela at a farmer's market in beautiful Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, um, maybe two months ago or so, give or take. And um, she had a booth there with um, she was running with someone and just so, well, what's this all about? And it's basically a group that, uh, to my understanding, she started up a few years ago and they go around to various beaches in Nova Scotia and pick up garbage. Um, turns out there's a lot of garbage in the ocean, uh, it washes up on the shores and it's not good. It's an eyesore, it's bad for the environment, not good for the animals, etc. I'm sure she'll tell us all about uh, the details of that. Um, and I was just really inspired by the fact that she started up this group and that um, she basically just organized, essentially um, the group my understanding organizes um, outings with you know volunteers from the community just coming out and they'll you know bring their kids if they've got them you know don't have to have kids to go of course um, but just basically arranges groups of folks to go out and and just collect garbage you know fishing nets etc cetera, etc cetera, whatever whatever it is that's washing up on the shore um so they've collected you know i believe a million pounds of garbage or millions i can't remember the exact details we'll we'll find out soon but uh just really inspiring on, on a number of different levels. And I thought it'd be great to chat with her um, in part just to promote the group. So folks that might be interested in participating, I'm curious if there's other groups out there. So I'm going to ask her if there's, um, if you don't happen to live in Nova Scotia, there might be groups in your neck of the woods if you're inspired to do something like that. Um, of course, with all of the Optimistic Future podcast episodes, we uh, I, I do my best to try to find simple steps that we can all take that uh, we just bring into our day-to-day -day lives to help make the world a better place. Um, you know, and of course, as as promised in other episodes, there's going to be uh, recommendations for simple steps we can all take as well as more involved steps. So if you're thinking like, well, you know, what can I do that, you know, doesn't involve going out, you know, for a few hours here and there to help pick up garbage on the beach. Um, I'm sure there's simple steps like don't throw garbage in the ocean, don't litter, but there might be some other steps that uh, will come up from the interview. But um uh, even if there aren't any um, other non-logical steps like don't litter, um, I hope that this uh, interview serves to inspire you as it's um, hopefully going to inspire me. I'm already inspired, uh, having talked to Angela already, um, about just the fact that there's you know folks like her out there that start up these grassroots groups and just say, you know what, like there's a problem, I'm going to do something to solve it. Um, if memory serves from the conversation that we had the other day, there's, believe it or not, you know, government red tape that goes around people being allowed to go out and, you know, pick up garbage on the beaches. And so um, just the fact that, you know, um, our, our um, organized institutions are not taking care of the garbage already. Um, it's wonderful that, um, you know, Angela's gone out, started up this group and that folks are going out and just, you know, getting the work done. So I think it's inspiring. Um, or it's a good inspiration that, uh, you know, if we so choose, we can make a really positive impact in this world. Um, and it really does come down to us to, you know, make those decisions. So it's just a logical thing to do. She's doing good in the world. And um, I'm really glad that she is. So um I think that's all I'm going to say for the intro. Um, so just before I bring Angela into the conversation here, um, into the interview, uh, just a quick reminder that um, the Optimistic Future podcast is sponsored by a Made Local Charity. Um, Made Local Charity runs a website um, called madelocalgroup.ca. Um, madelocalgroup.ca is a website that is a searchable directory of products that can be that, that are manufactured in Canada. So anything ranging from clothing to furniture to hand tools to um, hunting equipment, outdoor gear, sleeping bags, you name it. Um, there are so many categories on there, it's not even funny. Um, and so um, if you are interested in buying things, um, please consider going to madelocalgroup.ca first to see um, can you buy that product manufactured in Canada? If you're listening to this and thinking like, by golly, I don't live in Canada. I live in the United States of America. I'd rather buy something made in USA. Well, we do have madelocalgroup.com um, and it is a database of companies that manufacture goods in the United States of America. If you live in another country and would like to buy goods made locally, I'm sorry, I do not have a website to send you to for that. Um, hopefully there's something in your neck of the woods. Um, but, you know, why would we care about buying things that are made locally? Well, when things are manufactured locally, it's good for the local economy. <clears throat> it's good for creating more jobs. Um, these companies that make things locally, that make goods locally, they are all small or medium-sized businesses, which help to support the, um, you know, the middle class, so to speak, um, helping to you know, um, in, in my opinion, bridge the divide between the um, incredibly 
um, well-to-do, wealthy, you know, large corporations that quite frankly, they, they have enough money. Um, let's, you know, They, they don't need more. Um, give your dollars to those small and medium sized businesses that are, you know, trying to make it in the world, um, you know, making goods locally, you know, not um, uh, exporting jobs to other other countries. Nothing against those other countries, but we, we you know, need those jobs here in our local, our, our, our local countries as well. So hence, you know, Made Local. Um, so why is Made Local a charity? Well, Made Local is a charity in that it's, um, uh, Not only is it promoting the um, uh, companies that make goods in Canada specifically, but also the other website for companies in the U.S., <clears throat> um, but made local charity, any uh, proceeds that are um, uh, uh, gained. Sorry, it's been, been a long day here. Forgive the uh, the, uh, uh, the the mush mouth here today. Um, <clears throat> any proceeds that are gained are uh, then that go that are gained over and above running the websites. They go to um, another registered charity here in Canada called Second Harvest. Um, Second Harvest is an amazing charity that basically goes around and collects food from uh, grocery stores and bakeries and uh, um, you know restaurants and other groups that um, basically have extra food that is perfectly good, um, just wasn't able to be sold in time, um, and that food is otherwise destined for the trash. Um, heap or the compost bin. And so they collect that food, they bring it to local food banks, and then that food is then doled out to um, folks who who need that food. Um, so it's just a, a wonderful group in that they're doing so many good things and you know, helping folks that are, you know, struggling financially, uh, folks that are impoverished, um, but then also rescuing food that, you know, took a lot of um, time and energy and effort to make that otherwise was just going to be thrown out. Um, and they're actually having that food go to, to go to use, uh, to actually be used. Um, so, you know, diverting food away from landfills and just contributing towards, um, you know, food sustainability um, in the world. So it's a wonderful charity. And so we're really happy to support them as best we can with any um, proceeds that we're able to um, uh, gain from our, from our sponsors. Uh, from the uh, Made Local Charity sponsors. So um, please uh, do check out those websites, madelocalgroup.ca or for the um, US version, madelocalgroup.com. Um, please consider joining our mailing list, uh, which there's a little pop-up that will um, show up on the website uh, if you visit the website. And um, yeah, please consider um, supporting us um, on social media. We have an Instagram page, Made Local Group Canada, Made Local Group um, USA, um, and then pages of the same name on Facebook. So please consider supporting us um, so we can try to do as much good as we can in the world by spreading the word about um, these um, uh, hardworking, you know, Canadian and U.S. manufacturers um, trying to make goods here in our respective countries. So without further ado, I will now bring Angela into the podcast episode. All right, welcome back to the podcast, and I am now joined by Angela from Scotian Shores. Uh, Angela, th thanks so much for speaking with me today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about what we do. I, I'm excited to hear more about it. Um, I was saying in the intro that uh, you know we chatted a bit at the farmers market a couple months ago, but I'd like to hear more details. So I'm glad we get to get into it today. Um, just before we jump into those details, would you mind just giving folks a little background about you know who you are and uh, how you why you why you started up Scotian Shores and what the what the Scotian Shore uh, Scotian Shores Cleanup Project is all about, please. Uh, so my name's Angela Riley, uh, born and bred uh, Nova Scotian from the Eastern Shore. I grew up in a fishing family, turned into a sailor, naval reservist. Uh, so the ocean's always been really strong uh, in my life. And as a Nova Scotianer, we kind of all depend on the ocean. So uh, the thing I do now in my life is the Scotian Shores Cleanup Project, which is shoreline cleanup uh, and sometimes land-based too. So it kind of come from my love of the ocean, but it also come from a need because um, not only do I love the ocean, but I also love my children. I am a mother of two young boys uh, and little concern, probably a lot. Um, and when I had my second child, I went into a pretty bad eco depression because it kind of all hit me at once. I was like, oh, <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> this is scary. Um, and I, I don't have any fancy degrees or I'm not I didn't do university and 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 when I started this that was like a bad thing you know but I was like but I am good at teamwork and building like relationships and planning events so I kind of took all the things I was good at and turned it into doing something 
which was cleaning the shorelines, which I've come to find out and I kind of knew it's just a really easy way to transition into doing just something to help the future as much as bending over and picking up garbage is little, it does add up. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's super important. And um, could you maybe just speak a little bit more to, you know, how, you know, picking up that garbage is important for the future? Oh, uh, well, it depends on how deep you want to get. Uh, first and foremost, health uh, for me, it, and not just physical health, like we're five people, they're like, Oh, my gosh, we're eating microplastics. And I'm like, No, no, you're, you're breathing it. <laughs> and it's in your brain. I'm like, just let's accept that. Uh, really bad for our health, obviously. Um, well, not obviously some people, but then also mental health, like for me to go sit on a beach that's dirty, I just can't. I'm like, no, nah, this is not right. Um, and it's just, it's not good for your mental health to be somewhere that's just covered in garbage. Um, and I mean, the climate as well. Um, if you really want to get into the science of it, the plastics in the water actually speed up the temperature of the water heating up it causes things to die and if we don't have the large organisms like whales and all that stuff doing all the currents and getting into all that stuff it uh it doesn't work um and the more plastics and man-made stuff that gets into the ocean the worse off it is and you can go down a really big dark deep rabbit hole um what it really boils down for me is the more macroplastics we clean up uh, the less microplastics there will be. And hopefully that's going to help us in the long run. So catch it before it goes back out to sea and we end up eating it because I think that's what's happening. Yeah. So I'm, I'm gathering that a lot of what you pick up um, on your cleanups uh, is plastic. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of plastics, uh, variety of plastics There's certain industries we see more of, but uh, a lot of plastic, styrofoam, which is plastic, rope, which is plastic, lobster traps, which are plastic, uh, film plastic, which is plastic. Uh, everything is plastic. We do find metal, uh, which we do clean up because it can erode into something really sharp. And we do find glass, which once again, it could be really sharp. So we get rid of that as well. And then there's like oil products, which if you really look at plastic, it's oil. I don't even like calling it. I'm just like, it's all. Oil. How does that even work? You know, how do they take the oil and turn it into like my toothbrush? Like, it's just, I don't even understand the science there. It's very odd. That part's beyond me. We do have someone that takes some of our ocean plastics and turns it into things. And he tries to explain it to me. I'm like, that's good job. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to keep picking it up and you keep doing your part that's beyond me. But yeah, when I look at a beach that's covered in plastic pollution, I actually look at it and I say, that's an oil spill. It's just a concrete piece of hard oil that's been turned into something else. And and I mean, we're always like down with oil, but it's like, uh, no, it's not really down with plastic. You know, they actually sell way more oil making plastic. Pretty sure that's how it works. Fact check me, please. But, you know, I'm pretty sure if you really look into it, uh, a lot more gasoline or oil or whatever it is, petroleum, I guess. Uh, it goes into making plastics, which are needed in certain things in certain places of the world. Like I'm not saying it's evil, but the, um, our consumption is uh, at an incredible rate right now. And we, there's just too much of it. It, yeah. it. it does make me, you know, sort of scratch my head a bit, bit when folks are just, you know, like, oh, like I'm against, you know, this and that for the environment. And then it's like, what, well, I'm going to like keep getting my new iPhone, you know, every time a new one comes out or, you know, this and that, you know, it's like, oh, like we, yeah, plastic is, comes from oil, as you said. So yeah, there's, <laughs> sometimes folks don't really make the connection, I suppose. Um, well, it's, I think that's purpose. I'm going to, you know, I think not, not us, but we're not taught that for a reason they don't want the connection to be there <laughs> like there's sometimes you get to look at it that way yeah well those marketing geniuses out there you know they uh yeah would probably rather we weren't thinking about that um and that might might damage the bottom line potentially yep it's true <laughs> but uh we, we yeah uh education is power absolutely yeah <laughs> um I, I didn't i didn't know lobster traps were made from plastic these days i mean we have like a nice beautiful wooden one in our in our garden for decoration but uh they're plastic nowadays well my my grandfather fished with the wooden ones um so they're metal most they still use wooden ones some of the guys are in spring fishing when it's uh closer in 
to the shore, they'll use the wooden pots, uh, lobster traps. But a lot of them have switched to the metal ones, which are coated in PVC plastic. The netting is plastic. The escape hatches, which are mandatory to have on, are also made from a PVC plastic. And then there are actually lobster traps that are fully plastic now, which do not, I'm told, don't hold up very well to Nova Scotia's weather. They get smashed up pretty quick. So a lot of the fishing industry and all industries, I'm not trying to point fingers, have turned to plastic. It's just really sad that because it's such an ocean-based industry that it's all plastic. Um, when I look back at what my grandfather fished with, it was mostly wood, hemp, cotton, and metal. Um, so that just kind of goes away, kind of. Yeah. So um, do you have a, uh, your kind of, I think earlier you said that there are certain industries that seem to be um, disproportionately putting more plastic into the ocean. So would you be able to speak to where, where the, where's all this garbage coming from? Um, so in Nova Scotia, so that's, it's very regional. So like, if you talk to me about Halifax Harbor, um, it's coming from the people that are living on the Harbor. <laughs> Thank you. Single use plastics and Tim Hortons cups and tampon applicators and cruise ships, by the way, too. Uh, and, film plastics and all that city urban garbage where if we go down the Northumberland Strait, it's kind of more plasticky stuff that's coming up the St. Lawrence or there's like more plastic netting, a lot of film plastic. But if we go down to say Barrington, I can go to a beach and there'll be a thousand lobster traps on it. And I'm not exaggerating. A thousand. We've cleaned really a thousand. Uh, we've cleaned two thousand five hundred off an island that's less than five kilometers, and we still haven't finished. Uh, we've cleaned a hundred off of that's like a not even kilometer beach, and there's still two hundred more that we weren't able to get. There's two hundred lobster traps sitting down Hemian's Head, which is southwest Nova, uh, and that's about three kilometers worth go to Bon Portage Island, and I can't even count them. There's that many. But then if you go up in the Bay of Fundy, world's highest tides, extreme currents, um, the rope and the plastic and the buoys and the netting and bait bags and plastic strapping from fishing, it is, it's like 80% fishing gear. Um, and it's not really anybody's fault on purpose, by old habits, but like we get the entire Eastern seaboard, it gets sucked up in there. So we see like stuff from Maine, USA, New York. I've actually got two octopus pots sitting over there that are from, uh, I identified one is from Portugal today. I found out what vessel wow. it came from. So wow. we, we get stuff that's from all over and and the thing with nova scotia when you look at the bay of fundy it's it's we're getting everybody's garbage it just gets sucked in there and because it is like the highest concentration of fishing on the eastern seaboard um that's what we see is fishing gear uh we see a lot of fishing gear in nova scotia and there's also some farm type plastics and construction debris is a lot. And then your residential plastic bottles. I cannot get over how many plastic bottles we find. It is intense. Yeah. Um. So I'm just, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if there's anybody to know this, but if anybody would know, you would know, Um. you know, say in the Halifax Harbor where you're saying it's folks, you know, living on the living by the Halifax Harbor like is it people throwing garbage in the water like please say no because that just seems like what your century do we live in here but is it just is it litter is it stuff like blowing out of garbage cans is it like where where is this coming from it's a mixture so I mean there's definitely bad apples in every crew there's definitely people that throw things on the ground cigarette butts oh my um I I don't get it they're plastic they're everywhere uh, but there, it's it's a, always a combination of things. You can never point your finger, and that's why you can't say it's their fault because it's always a combination. Like in Halifax Harbor, I know like there's the, the people that are doing it on purpose. A lot of the outflow pipes, like your drainage systems, when it rains a lot, it catches all the garbage and it gets out those drainage systems. So I'll, I will see it caught in some of the grates, but it doesn't catch. We don't have actual nets. Uh, and then some of it, it blows out of garbage cans that aren't maintained, out of dumpsters. Uh, I know Alderney Landing, it's like a wind tunnel. So 
it is so dirty in there. Most of it's not their garbage. People open up the uh, door of their car and it blows out. Um, the Novus, Great Nova Scotia Pick Me Up program, they have a data point that says 80% of land-based litter uh, is incidental. So it's like by accident like it blew out of your car or it blew out of a garbage that wasn't unfilled or something. So I, I think it's a lot of that, but there's some definite intentional dumping that happens. And in the Halifax Harbor, I, I know of places that are lobster bands are being dumped right out from their facilities and nobody will do anything. <laughs> uh, so if they're doing it, I'm sure it's happening in other places as well. So, yeah. yeah. So I guess maybe just on that note, because one one of the one of the goals with um, these interviews is to kind of um, you know kind of th this interview in particular is like kind of inspire folks that like hey there's like Angela's out there she started this you know grassroots you're doing good in the world so it's kind of an inspirational episode but then with with each episode if, if applicable which most of them have been so far um, I like to try to kind of distill it down to like simple steps that anyone can take without putting in any appreciable time money effort to, to say like hey we can all make little uh efforts each day uh, or week or whatnot to make help make the world a better place collectively um you know mm -hmm. so not not littering would be one so hopefully most of us are already doing that um, we'll also talk about some bigger steps like take a few hours and you know uh, volunteer with you guys so we'll, we'll get into that uh, in terms of how those options work but in terms of simple steps um so i'm just thinking so far you know maybe be careful not to have loose garbage in your car on a windy day to let it blow out. Um, be careful with your garbage. I know um, like in our household, it's kind of like we always put out our garbage, uh, you know, our garbage pickup is Tuesday morning. So Monday night we put the bags out, but if it's a windstorm, it's like, you know, not to be mean here or anything, but like, don't be a bozo. Don't put out your bags of garbage when it's all just going to blow away and get all over the place. But like, um, what, uh, do, do you have any advice in terms of simple steps that we can all take to kind of have maybe less incidental garbage as they're politely calling it? Uh, definitely the, the car is a big one. It's, uh, keeping a bag in there to, to, like, I don't want to tell people your car is so messy because I'm like, oh, good job. You're not throwing it out your window, you know? so keep I try to keep a bag I'm not the best uh and just keeping an eye on that but then also is is just paying attention to what you're actually consuming as well uh because can you can consume a lot which makes the garbage and, and that sort of thing but even on your own uh like walks every day like when I'm walking I try to at least pick up one thing I'm like I got at least one hand I can pick up one thing and it does add up um so things like that, carrying a bag with you anytime you go to the beach is a big one for us because we have we have a lot of solo pickers um, that work with us and, and do their own cleanups and it all adds up, right? Yeah. Okay, great. If you think of any other ones while we're chatting, please uh, let me know because I've got a, I've got a couple of good ones there to add to our website. But um, yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. Um, so in terms of cruise ships, um, you know, is that, I don't know, do you, do you have any insight in terms of, is that just folks like, you know, like, oops, it, like my, my plastic cup blew out of my hand or uh, are they dumping garbage out or like where, how are they making uh, I, more waste? I mean, them? everybody, everybody has their own opinion. Uh, I will say they have these little water pack things only here when the cruise ships are here. It's really, I don't know where they're coming from. And I, I, as someone that lives and picks up a lot of stuff in the Halifax Harbor, uh, there's a lot of tampon applicators, like a lot of them, which doesn't make sense because our waste facilities now catch them. Um, and during COVID, they like went away. I was like, oh, where'd all the tampon applicators go? They stopped. And then I swear to gosh, and I mean, I can't prove this, but when the cruise ships come back, so did the tampon applicators. And I was like, nah, they're not doing that. But I mean, I also can't prove that because just the other day, I found a sewage pipe coming out of Eastern Passage shoreline with poo-poo coming out of it and a tampon. And I was like, is is that allowed anymore? It's like, I didn't think we were allowed to have straight sewage pipes into the harbor anymore. So yeah, by the way, stop swimming in the harbor. There's still straight sewage going in there. Yummy. 
Yeah. And, you know, even when they say it's safe to swim in that harbor, I've never done it. And I don't know that I ever will, you know, plenty of other water opportunities in uh, Nova Scotia. So yeah. yeah, five, five minutes out, even Rainbow Haven, Rainbow Haven was like, they're like, don't swim here, the bacteria. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway, I, uh, I only swim in the ocean now, actually. It's one of those things that I just, I get pretty freaked out about because all that blue green algae. So yeah yeah there's a lot lots of things to think about um with the the aquatic side of things um <laughs> i'm curious so when you collect um all these lobster traps or other types of you know plastic waste or other yeah i guess the more the plastic waste um or debris or whatnot how like what do you do with it like where do you just drop it in a recycling bin like where, where does it all go uh so when we started uh four years ago um, a lot of it was going to the landfill mostly because I didn't know any better uh, and there was no program. So over the last four years, a lot of programs were developed. Bad news is the government stopped funding them. So uh, we can now recycle currently while the programs are still running off the little tiny bit of funding they have left and volunteerism. Uh, we can recycle lobster traps. So they get squished and the metal gets recycled. We can recycle rope if it gets funded by the DFO. Uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. We can recycle metal. We can recycle tires uh, through Divert Nova Scotia. And the tires that have like a rim in them, we get them crushed so that we can get the tire out and the rim and deal with that. Uh, film plastics, so like bags and Ziploc bags and canvas bags that like the plastic canvas, we can get those recycled through sustained technologies uh, in Chester. Nova Scotia, uh, sea glass and any glass we turn into different things uh, or give away to artists. Uh, and then uh, if we don't recycle it, we repurpose it first. But really, we can recycle if with the proper funding, that's the catch, the funding and government support, you can recycle 80 percent of what you're picking up on the shorelines in, in Nova Scotia. Uh, in I mean, certain areas, like if I go down the Digby Neck, it is a lot of styrofoam and that's not recyclable. That stuff's evil. Uh, but really, all we can't recycle right now is polystyrene that we find on the ocean because it's in really bad condition. Shoes, which we find a lot of single shoes. A lot. So like textiles and car seats and stuff like that, just kind of it's vinyl. And then... Uh, mixed materials so if it has like plastic and metal on it unless we can separate out that stuff it's not good and the big one this year is the marine plastics that we can also get recycled anything that's like a hard plastic as long as it doesn't have pieces of metal in it then it's good to go it gets shredded up and turned into a biodiesel so and that's locally done too so yeah okay i'm just going to add to the simple steps list don't throw a car seat in ocean um just life or advice fridges. for everybody listening or for oh fridges too okay i'll add that to the list as Find well. a lot of fridges and i swear we were on an island one time and one washed the shore as we were standing there and i was like are you kidding me right now it's like oh my gosh anyway <laughs> well there, there you have it i guess you've seen everything angela um <laughs> We've seen a lot. I'm waiting for yeah. uh, a few things to wash ashore. So you know. yeah, no washing machines so far. Chest freezers. No, well, chest freezers, yes. Okay. Washer machines we find dumped. Uh, I want a tire cutter, something to cut tires, so uh, that we can because we just find a lot. The really, really, really big tires are not recyclable. So right now we're actually giving them to a monster truck guy who's making a rally yard out of them. So cool. something. Okay. Something at least. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to remember, and, and maybe I miss, I'm miss misremembering here, but um, I think when we were chatting at the farmer's market where we met, um, did uh, did you tell me, is there some some red tape like around permits and from your face? I'm thinking there's some story there. So what's, uh, could you tell us about the red tape around uh, doing this good in the world that uh, you have to jump through some hoops for? Uh, it, it's kind of insane. Ignorance is bliss. I shouldn't say that, but, um, I definitely might've been brought up to ask forgiveness sometimes. So. Um, so apparently 
to clean certain places, uh, you have to have multiple permits, which we do get them. And I knew about the ATV taking a permit. If you want to take your ATV on a beach, you're supposed to have a permit. I am not telling anybody what they're supposed to do. I am not the Department of Natural Resources. You do what you want. But me personally, I need to have a permit to have that ATV on the beach. And it has to be all checked in the boxes and everything and all my courses uh, to go on certain species at risk beaches. It's like an eight page permit that has now taken over six months for me to try to get, which requires me to get references from scientists. And uh, I have to do a resume and it's kind of crazy. So that's for the species at risk critical habitats. And then like, if you look at places like Acadia University owns, um, you you need their permission and then you need the private land permission and then the one time they told me i couldn't clean unless their their teacher people came with us and watched us and we paid them a certain amount of money and i was like what? <laughs> no um and then there's other places like the nova scotia nature trust stones so they're really protecting it and trying to conserve it so you have to go through them to get permission it is a whole can of worms. The more you get into it, the more, uh, yeah, I have to, I carry liability insurance. Um, we still make people sign waivers, plus all the other insurances that I need to carry. Like the list goes on and I hate, sometimes I hate going over it because my big goal is for people to like, I like I want them to know, but I, I don't want them to know. I always just kind of wanted to keep them sheltered. I was like, no, no, I'll just come clean the beach because you're doing a good thing. And nobody would stop you from doing that. Why would they ever stop you from cleaning a beach? And now I'm at the point where I'm like, you know what? No, I'm getting sick of this. Everybody, guess what I have to do to clean this beach? How ridiculous is that? And a lot of them do agree. Sometimes it, it does make sense. Like if it's piping flow over habitat, don't go storming in there with an ATV and ripping stuff out of like, to me, that's common sense yeah. to other people. It might not be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It gets pretty involved. Um, so just to, just to clarify. So I'm assuming it's if there's what like two or more people gathering to clean up a beach, like that's where you need a permit. Like if I'm just walking on any old beach that say not on private land, I'm probably not going to get arrested for picking up a piece of garbage that I see. It's just if it's an, a, a group of X number of people that that's where you need the permit. Yeah, that's basically is my understanding what they've told me. If it's a group of two or more people, that's when you would need the permit because then they're actually going to do damage and. I understand that, but part of me is like, have you met myself and my partner who can get like a hundred traps or 200 buoys ourselves in a weekend? Like sometimes it's not a matter of how many people, it's a matter of if they're trained. So someone who doesn't know what they're doing, a singular person could do way more damage than my group of 10 trained people could do. Like that's, so that's kind of where I'm like, mm, it doesn't really make sense, but as far as the rules go, you can go do it. But if you're in a critical habitat and you pick up something and disturb a piping plover's uh, nest, you could get fined a million dollars. Wow. Yeah. They yeah. don't tell people that. They're like, no, everybody knows that. I'm like, no, no, no they don't. <laughs> I don't think I learned that in school, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Raven, ha Raven, Rainbow Haven Beach, uh, Martinique Beach, Clam Harbor Beach. That's all critical habitat. So if somebody really wanted to put a stink up in the air and you're out there digging a hole, you know, for like a sandcastle building competition, why are you allowed to do that in a critical habitat but not cleaning it up? So it's, they tell, I don't know. I do feel a little bit like we're being targeted. I'm like, guys, come on. Like we're just trying to clean beaches. But um, I try to see from both points of view because like i said if somebody goes in there tearing up a, a place that the birds are actually at it could be really bad so i try to i'm doing the permits as much as it's like oh but um it is it is a needed thing and it does keep some of these places and species uh safe so yeah i'm, I'm just curious like what would the tearing up involve um so things are half buried or something and you're trying to get them out of the sand or something yeah, so lobster traps, uh, it's a really good one. Tires, they, they're they like halfway in, it. like a dune, for me, a, a really good example is a dune system with the marum grass. Know that lobster traps not holding the dune together, 
but the marum grass that has grown up in that trap, which has massive root systems, is, is holding the dune together. So if you rip out that trap, you've now actually ripped out all the marum grass. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the trap's holding it, it's that the vegetation that grew up. So if you rip that out and you make a hole in the dune, you've now made a place for it to erode through and you've just maybe breached a dune and now made a dune system of salt marsh. So it's there's there's things to think about. So I do have a rule, like if you need to rip it out, we, uh, we send somebody trained to kind of go look at it. Where is it sitting? How deep is it? uh what type of vegetation's in it like if it's in a rose bush i i don't care take it um the rose bush is going to come back stronger than it was before but if it's a marum grass which is that long wavy dune grass it's it's actually like you got to be really careful with that stuff mm. so yeah how how did you learn uh to know like what's what's safe to like how, how did you learn about these things i'm assuming they didn't teach you that uh, when you're you know in your in your line of work no uh hands-on uh i'm a very boots on the ground hands-on learner um so anytime that i was out with like anybody any other organizations i would pay attention i'd listen i've worked with other organizations that had had more uh experience than me so it's a lot of learning off of other people learning from the community um even the birds for example like if you look at a book they only migrate from this time to this time but i'm not going to listen to that i'm going to call the local birder guy and i'd be like hey mark i'm clover still around no nah, sweet <laughs> you know so i we we kind of I, I take from other people's knowledge as well and it's just a lot of a lot of hands-on learning and just uh just seminars and things like that and research as well just because there was one point we were looking up, is it better to leave the tire or is it better to take the tire? Because there's something living in it. And I'm like, no, take the tire. And me and a girl, we had it out for like a year. And then finally she was like, okay, hey, it's better to take the tire. Fine, take them. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so but sometimes it's a bit of research, but with the traps, leave them for the next storm and the storm will get them out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I had no idea there was such a learning curve with it. It's like, oh, it's picking up garbage. How could, what could be simpler? But it's, it's not all that simple. It, there's a lot to it. Uh, it can be really simple. It can be as simple as going for a walk out my door and picking up the can that blew out of somebody's bag. Or it could be, hey, we're going to go take an ATV in the woods for three kilometers down as far as we can go and then hike a kilometer and then fill it up and try to get it out. And oh, darn, we got too much. So, you know, like there there can be really, really easy cleanups or they can be really logistically challenging. Like, uh, we lived on an island for a week. That was, that's a whole different uh, bag of worms, I guess. <laughs> was that the island with the 2,500 plus lobster traps? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah clean morning morning tonight and invited people on the island every day we had 75 different people come we actually had other people come and stay on the island with us too so uh nova scotia's tallest lighthouse and you'd wake up and the sheep would be all around and then you go and play. you can actually see the difference on google maps it's a uh, it's really cool to be like oh those black dots are gone you know <laughs> so that's fantastic and i really appreciate you perpetuating nova scotians stereotypes <laughs> just all lighthouses and sheep out here um, it is it's my favorite <laughs> yeah, and lobster traps obviously yep yeah um so uh angela could you speak a little bit to how uh, my folks are listening and thinking like man oh man i'd i'd like to get involved with uh, actually sorry i i'm gonna ask you this question it's gonna have one quick first though um are, are there other groups in other provinces parts of other parts of the world uh, that do do similar things to what you're doing yeah, a, a ton. Um, I'll start with Nova Scotia. Um, part of the reason actually why I started Scotian Shores is because there's a group here and a group there and a group there and a group there and a group there. And there's all these little tiny groups and making all the little tiny, but we went and took everything and took the data and, went and put it together. But there's some groups that don't add data to ours. So we kind of sucked up a lot of the little ones and tried to help them out. But um, there's uh, ACAP Cape Breton. They have the trash formers who I love. It's the summer students come out every summer and they go do cleanups around Cape Breton all summer. I'm like, awesome. Uh, the Harborville Restoration Society is amazing. It's one of their members. Was, she's pretty crazy, but uh, out every day. But their area is absolutely 
bombed with garbage uh, in the winter time and they keep up on it. Friends of the Scotts Bay Salt Marsh, uh, that's another community group. There's Clean Annapolis River Project, there's Yarmouth Shores, there's uh, Coastal Actions, a big one they've been around for a while. Cape Breton Environmental Association. So if anywhere you are in Nova Scotia, reach out to us and we'll tell you who to get involved with because sometimes traveling is a thing, right? Uh, but there's there's a lot of garbage or debris washing ashore all around. But if you look out in the world, um, one of my inspirations was for Ocean. And I think they're down in like the Southern Islands. They actually sell bracelets. They say buy a bracelet or remove a pound of garbage. I was like, ah, good idea. Um, so that's kind of how we start it. And then my one of my favorite ones, because everybody knows about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Everybody knows about the Garbage Island. Uh, the cleanup prod that Ocean Ocean Cleanup Project, that's what they're called. And they're basically taking super trawlers and taking care of this uh, garbage patch. They've done 100 retrievals, and each retrieval is like hundreds of thousands of kgs of basically what we're finding, just saying. Um, and it, it's neat because a lot of people know them, so it creates a lot of awareness. And then all the little kids really liked when Mr. Beast did his cleanup thing. All little kids knew about ocean cleanup when Mr. Beast was doing it. So all of any, if there's anybody famous out there, make it cool. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, good plug for the famous people. Yeah. Awesome. Make, make beach cleanups cool. <laughs> it, it is cool. I mean, what's better than, you know, you know, uh, investing in our future, making the world a more beautiful place. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so if folks are interested in uh, getting involved with Scotian Source, ah, man, oh man, I don't know if it's a tongue twister for me, maybe, maybe I'm the only one of uh, folks are interested in getting involved with Scotian Shores cleanup project, uh, Angela, um, what can they, what can they do? Uh, so, so there's lots, uh, we're pretty active on social media. Facebook's my favorite because it actually stays there. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and we have a website, uh, Scotian Shores, pretty easy to find uh, at www.scotianshores.com. Uh, and we also have a Facebook group. So people, sometimes there's people that are out there doing cleanups on their own every day and that adds up. So like when we look at our cleanup data that we collect, about 30% of it is the solo pickers that are going out there and picking up like a little bit and just reporting back to us. So you can do your own cleanups or you can come uh, join in on our group cleanup. So we used to host a cleanup almost every weekend. We have slowed down because uh, funding is no longer available, uh, but we're still going strong with 400,000 pounds this year. So that's uh, no number to balk at. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you can you can follow us. And if you send us an email, we'll actually start sending you email alerts of where the cleanups are. I will let anybody listening know that a lot of our cleanups are focused in the Bay of Fundy, Southwest Nova and Digby Neck because that is where the majority of the garbage is. In the winter time, we can go clean the same beach every tide, every high tide. Give me an hour after and we can go clean that beach. It's, it is very scary. Um, and yeah, so if you wanna get involved, please do. And if you just, you're not able to go out on the shoreline, I like to, we're actually, we're all inclusive. Um, there's lots to do other than picking up garbage. Um, there used to be a commercial when I was little. It was uh, the one that said, everybody's good at something. There's a little T-Rex kid. Anyway, everybody's good at something. <laughs> the T-Rex mm -hmm. kid uh, his, his dinosaur noises. Um, so we actually have people come to our cleanups and sometimes they sit at the table and they help us with admin. So maybe they're not steady enough on their feet, but they can sign people in and make them sign the waivers and make sure they get gloves. And I've got one lady that if I'm down St. Mary's Bayway, you better believe we're getting cookies delivered. Do you know what lights up beach cleaners life? Cookies that were made by somebody who's like, I can't help you, but I can give you cookies. And that that's love right there. So, you know, there's, there's a way, and then there's some people who just do data. They love playing with numbers. So, and I don't, <laughs> I'm being honest, it's not my favorite thing to do. So it's, uh, if, you, if you're into numbers and making graphs and stuff, my data team will welcome you aboard. <laughs> so there's, there's something for everyone. Some people just write letters to the government and 
annoy them for me instead of me annoying them, which is great. <laughs> it's always good to have that annoyance help, but yeah. <laughs> And I'm just curious, Angela, and that's awesome that there's so many opportunities and I just had, I had no idea. So thank you for telling us about this. Um, and I'm just curious, you said that, you know, funding is more paraphrasing here, but, you know, funding is a bit more limited. So where, where was the funding coming from, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, so we have a variety of sources of funding. Uh, a lot of people assume, I'm going to put this out there and you might have to fix your intro. So we'll see. A lot of people assume that we're a not-for-profit. We're actually a business that runs like a social enterprise because I find that a lot of the not-for-profits, they completely depend on the grants, completely. And we did a lot of depending on what was called the Federal uh, Fisheries and Oceans Go Gear Grant, um, which was a huge grant. And it was like millions of dollars. I think it was $32 million in Atlantic Canada last year. We got 150,000 of that, which went like so far for us. We we make money go far. Uh, so that was uh, the big one, but they stopped it this year. They were just like, we don't need to fund cleanups anymore. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, our data shows otherwise, guys. Uh, so that one, and it's not just us that lost our funding. See, with that remember i said the recycling programs mm -hmm. and that that's the scary thing because if the recycling programs aren't there and the guys can't take their rope and their traps to the landfill and they have to pay for it or i'm not saying it's going to happen but i have had guys tell me to my face overboard goes then and i'm like <laughs> please don't um but yeah it's it's why create barriers so the federal uh, Fisheries and Oceans Federal Ghost Gear Grant was the big, big one. Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture has a small grant program, which we can get like $5,000 for a whole bunch of things. But when you start adding in truck costs and insurances and my truck that just broke that cost me $2,000 to fix, that does not go far. <laughs> uh, a dumpster costs $600 to rent. Um, so yeah, it starts adding up. So the grants that were out there dried up, but because we're a social enterprise and that's the way we run, uh, we do the markets. So we've made it so that we can make our own money. I don't know if the listeners get to see pictures and say, oh, you can't see it, but like we make stuff. Yeah, you know. <laughs> we make stuff out of the garbage. So we have got a little bit of funding coming in for that. So like my truck just got fixed because of the stuff that we sell at the market. And I mean, the Scotian Shores truck and, and, so even though we don't have the grants, we've been able to keep going. And then there's what's called in-kind donations. So I do not have a tractor trailer, 18 wheeler with a boom on it to lift big 800 pound tires, but my friend does. <laughs> and he thinks what we're doing is really cool. So people will say, oh, I'll just use my stuff and, and that sort of thing. Our work yards, uh, we don't actually have to pay for because they're donated by local yokels, not the government. That is local people saying, you need to recycle this here. Here's some space. So it's uh, it's just a lot of community involvement. But yeah, our main income right now is the market stuff. And then also we do still get donations. People still donate to us, even though they're not getting a tax write off. They're like, nah, you're putting it to good use. Uh, and then we also have a sponsorship program. So if there's any big businesses out there <laughs> want to help us out, uh, we do have a few sponsors. So yeah, there's we take money any way that we find it right now. And and we do average about two, it's about two a dollar per pound, which is way cheaper than other cleanup groups okay. yes yeah well. <laughs> and and i'll just say this it's better to prevent it it's way cheaper to prevent that than clean up in the aftermath my grandmother's saying an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and it's true <laughs> I yeah. say the same thing almost every day in my clinical practice. So yeah, it's a very good <laughs> advice on a number of different levels, including for environmental uh, reasons, hundred um, yes. percent. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much for what you do, 
Angela. Um, it's uh, yeah, really awesome. I was really inspired when I learned about you folks. Um, I know my wife's still planning to coordinate a, a homeschool group uh, kind of get together um, coming out with helping you guys sometime. And um, I really hope folks listening are inspired to help out in some way, whether it's, you know, directly helping or donating or whatnot, um, or, or mm -hmm. to an analogous group if they're somewhere else in the world and aren't as emotionally invested in uh, Nova Scotia as we might be. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me and helping create awareness. And thank you also for what you do and your profession, because uh, I think a lot of people need to have more appreciation for what nature provides for us. And I tell you, after we clean summers up and the nature comes back to like it was, it is really amazing to kind of learn some of the benefits to what's actually just out there. You know, that's yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> my pleasure a lot, a lot of synergy um well um i will uh, post links to everything that you mentioned there um uh, angela in the show notes and uh thanks so much for everyone listening to this episode of the optimistic future podcast we hope you enjoyed it and please stay tuned for the next one